thank you so much for meeting with us today, Deborah. Please tell us your name, a little bit about your background, your family of origin, where you grew up, where you went to school, and how you got to be where you are today. My name is Deborah Cujino Deras, but I go by Deborah Deras because when I do speaking, no one can say Cujino, so I just decided to let it go. But I'm very proud of that name. My dad immigrated to this country from Bogota, Colombia, and that name Cujino, the origin of that name was Cohen. His family was Jewish and they were given the name Cujino by the Spaniards. So that goes back to my Sephardic uh, Jewish roots on his side. And then my mother is from Lithuania and they met in Brooklyn where all love happens, right? <laughs> and uh, had me and my brother David. And I grew up in uh, Long Island, New York. And then I moved to Chatsworth, California in the San Fernando Valley. Where did you go to school? What did you study? Uh, I went to school at Cal State Los Angeles and I studied, uh, I first started uh, studying business because my dad was very adamant that if I was going to live in this country that I needed to know business because I needed to make money and I was on that path to become, you know, a marketing person or public relations officer and I just had uh, an experience where my brother had passed away. He was 16 years old and he woke up one morning and he had had a, a seizure, a status epileptic seizure. And after he died, I had to really decide what did I want to do? Did I want to do what my father wanted me to do to make money? Or did I want to do something that I loved, something that was my purpose? And so I felt that, or I was led to, that my brother's death wasn't a tragedy but that it was a destiny and that his soul was contracted to be here for 16 years and when that contract was ended that I had a contract as well because I was really not wanting to live at that time I had survivor's guilt and I said okay well if I'm gonna live I'm gonna help people like my brother that have had disabilities or some sort of challenges to be successful in life so I went back to school and I majored in rehabilitation counseling and got my bachelor's degree in that and then got my master's degree in education and went on for 15 years to work with people with disabilities to help them get jobs. Please tell us a little bit about the calling that you expressed that you got at your brother's death, how that came to you, what the process felt like, what the experience was. Well, it, it really came to me in deep soul searching because one of the things I, I realized was the more that I blamed myself and the more that I had guilt and the more I was trying to figure out why, uh, the more sad and depressed I got. So I realized I had to change the question from why me or why did this happen or why couldn't it be different to what is the purpose here, to what is the learning here. And I found in my life that when I have challenges, that's kind of the question that takes me to a better place, that takes me to a place of not victimhood but being inspired. And so I started asking myself, well, what is my purpose? You know, what am I here to do? And uh, I did a lot of prayer and I did a lot of meditation. And up until that time, the only religious upbringing I had was with temple. You know, and I would, you know, I really would feel the power and the presence of God when I would sing in Hebrew. And it was like, I, I didn't really understand all the time what I was singing, but I felt the presence. And it was like that experience of spirituality through that just opened up a whole other path and I actually really started getting abusive with myself with turning to alcohol and turning to um, men and just getting out of my head because I just couldn't deal with the pain and it was through that that I was led to 12-step uh, programs of recovery and was able to find a higher power that was different than the God that was judging me it was a higher power that was forgiving a higher power that was loving and a higher power that was speaking to me that I could hear. You know, I actually heard divine guidance say to me, this is your purpose, this is what you're here to do. And it wasn't like all laid out, like, you know, here's your business plan and this is your vision, this is your vision. It's just like, go here, enroll in this class, take this major. And I was just open and receptive to listening to finding out what was the next step and what was the next step and what was the next step. And that's one of the things that I've learned on my spiritual path is it's not so much about praying and asking, but about listening and receiving and being more open to that. Do you currently hold an employment position? Yes. <laughs> please tell me, please tell us about that. 
Yeah, I have a company. Uh, I am the owner and CEO of a company called Synergy Unlimited. And Synergy is the whole concept that when two or more are gathered with the same purpose and energy that they can achieve more than you could ever do it alone. And so I started this company because I had a life coaching company called Passionate Living Now to help people live passionately, purposefully, and prosperously doing what they love and being abundant as, as well. And I was very, very burnt out on that business on my own and because I was working full time. And then I went part time, but still it was difficult. And so I partnered up with this lovely woman named Adelaide O'Dunton. And we just had so many similarities with what we were doing and also what we were struggling with, with our addiction. And our major addiction was adrenaline addiction and just pushing ourselves too much, too far. It was just like going, going, going that for her, she burnt out her adrenal glands and was actually had to stop her career as a director and a writer and an actress um, because she just completely burnt out where she could not do anything for a year. She was on bed rest and was diagnosed eventually with lupus. And I was beginning to go on that same path. It was a little bit less severe, my stage, but my hair was falling out. I was going from just getting colds to having bronchitis and then having pneumonia. And when that wouldn't slow me down, my car would slow me down. I had three car accidents, and I write about this in my book, in a period of six months. And then when I still wouldn't slow down, then my car was stolen. <laughs> the universe spirit was like, what is it gonna take for you to listen? And so my, once my car was gone and once I was sick, still I was trying to do more and more and more. And our whole philosophy when I came together with our company Synergy Unlimited is how to achieve more with less effort and how to be successful the ease and grace way without compromising your health and well-being. And so Adelaide and I started this professional development training company back in 2002. And she's no longer my active partner, but she's always my spiritual partner. In fact, she called me right before this interview and we're gonna continue our prayer partnership together. What other positions have you held in the past? Uh, well, when I first graduated from school, I worked at the Epilepsy uh, Foundation uh, do, running a job club to help people with seizures get jobs. Then I worked at Goodwill Industries, helping people with developmental disabilities to get jobs. And then I went to the Department of Rehabilitation, helping people with mental illness and people that were deaf and blind get jobs. And then what else? Oh, and then I worked with PV Jobs, helping people that had come out of prison get jobs. And then, you know, and, and now that I have my own business, it's not an either or. And I really uh, was at first tormented and feeling a little guilty when I started my own business because I was like, but I'm supposed to help people with disabilities, but I would find out that it wasn't the people with the disabilities that had the problem. It was the staff, <laughs> my coworkers, that were so burnt out that they couldn't be of service to the people with disabilities. So I said, I need to show them how they can be successful without burning out. Because at the government, you either left for three reasons. One, you got sick, some sort of disease. Two, you retired after like 40 years of service, or three, you died. And I was like 24 years old and I wasn't opting for any, either, either of those. So I said, there's gotta be a better way to be successful without killing yourself. And so I, I, I decided that working with people that didn't have disabilities was just as important. In fact, my brother David, after he passed, became my angel. And I heard him say to me, you know, Deborah, you need to do this. You need to start your own company. You're going to be able to serve more people. And still, even with my own company, my company focuses on helping busy professionals, and I do stress management, work-life balance, time management, leadership. But in addition, I still do work with foster youth, still do work with the homeless, still do work with people that are uh, have been in domestic violence situations that want to get their lives back together. So my work in rehabilitation is forever. When you talk about the, your brother communicating with you now, mm -hmm. or the other, the other earlier awakening that you had, and you hear a voice, you describe that twice now, is that a voice like you hear my voice, or is it more like your conscience, or is it more just like an internal impulse? Describe that to us. That is a really good question. You know, I've never dissected that voice, but I've had it like maybe five times in my life where it's been so strong and so powerful. And it actually is like an intuitive, like it is like my own voice, but it's, it's, a, it's a higher voice, it's a loving voice, it's a wise voice that guides me completely. You know, it doesn't 
it's not like in code or anything like that or in symbols because I've heard some people get symbols or they get ideas it's and it usually is something that I would never think of something that I would never on my own come up with I had this experience when I was on my honeymoon and I call this like my burning bush moment and I was like laying in Cozumel and I was just like under a palm tree and I, I just had gotten married and I heard this voice, your marriage isn't going to work. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was like, why? And they said, you need to learn to love yourself. I was like, I do love myself. What are you talking about? You know, I was just having this little inner dialogue. And then I had this magazine and it just like fell to the floor. And it was a science of mind magazine. And I had never read science of mind because I thought it was like Scientology. I didn't know what the word science meant. But there was this wonderful article by Louise Hay and Ayanna La Van Zant and all of these spiritual empowerment people that I followed and I really appreciated. And the book opened up to the back, like a directory, and it said Culver City Agape. And I had just moved to Culver City. And Agape means in Greek, unconditional love. And so I, it was leading me to go to the center. And that's the center where I actually started a lot of my spiritual studies and became a spiritual counselor and now lead a ministry to help people in recovery to, um, you know, leave fear and embrace faith. Please tell our viewers about the process of growth that you've undergone at Agape and the specific steps. Be specific, go in a little bit of detail. Sure. Well, a lot of the growth that I had at Agape was because I surrendered who I thought I was and what I thought my life would be and look like. Part of the studies and the spiritual principles and the laws taught me to let go of focusing on the visible and to trust the invisible, right? So if I would look out and say, well, this doesn't make sense that with this amount of money in the bank that I could buy a house. And so what Agape taught me, you know, just through the laws of attraction and just through the power of prayer, which is the same because thoughts are energy, words are prayer, everything we say we're speaking into existence, we're co-creating our reality. I was able to, you know, suddenly buy a home, suddenly, you know, get the house I want, you know, all these different things of manifesting. And I realized it's not about just the things, it's about consciousness. And what I, my, my goal in life is to have peace. This is why I wear my own, is to embrace peace. It's to be a light bearer and a way shower. And in order to have peace around me, I need to have peace within me. And so part of my practice at Agape was learning to be still because I could never be still before. It just was like, as an adrenaline addict, obviously, you know, I'm running around and going from place to place and thinking that faster and more is better and not realizing that in the stillness, they, the Dalai Lama says, I think you can achieve more in one hour of meditation than 23 hours of activity. So in the stillness, that's when I would hear the voices, you know, where I would hear that intuitive voice, that divine guidance, whatever you want to call it, that would say, go here, talk to this person, do that, do this. And when I would listen and follow, I would synchronistically be in the right place at the right time. And people would say, oh, you're so lucky in your life. I say, no. It is absolutely destiny because I am listening and following the direction. Because I think everybody, everybody does have like that intuitive guidance system, you know, just like we have the GPS in our car, we have our IGS in our mind that's constantly moment by moment saying, talk to this person, go here, do this, be available. Yet we're so tuned into that negative station, that K fear, all fear, tragedy all the time, 24 seven. And when we listen to that, our brain deletes, distorts, generalizes all the rest of it because whatever we focus on expands. And it just, we can hear it. So it's there for everyone. It's not just for me or for some other people. All of your listeners have the capacity. It's just the willingness to be still. And even now, like I'm not meditating for hours, but I'll do yoga, I'll walk on the beach, I'll sit in, by the fountain, I'll do mantras and chants, whatever I can do to get out of the eyesight and get into the insight. That's how I see transformation and growth in my life. You said a moment ago that we're co-creating our existence. Can you please explain what that means? Absolutely. Uh, my belief and my philosophy is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And God is not something outside of us, you know, kind of like that Santa Claus, old man in the sky. That God, whatever Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, whatever your listeners identify as God or a higher power is within us. And through our alignment 
with love, peace, joy, harmony, order, every moment we are co-creating the existence based on where we're focusing our energy. So for example, if I wake up in the morning and I say, okay, just for today, I am going to be so grateful and thankful for my opportunity to be of service. And I'm going to look and, and just be thankful every moment when I have an opportunity to be of service. And that's my focus. Then I'm co-creating. Then my experience is that. But if I wake up and I get up late and then I spill coffee on myself and I say, oh my goodness, I'm such a victim. Everybody, you know, everything is happening to me because of my upbringing, because of my ethnicity, because of my father, because of my mother, whatever, then instead of being in a place of empowerment, I'm in a place of blaming and victimhood. And that's part of what I teach when I work. I work with boys in rehabilitation in juvenile detention centers. And when I ask them, why are you here? If they say to me, well, it's because of he, she, them, and not taking responsibility and accountability for their actions, I know they're going to be bad. But if they say, I, you know, I made a bad decision and now I'm learning for it, or I made a choice that I regret and now I'm in recovery for it, I know that they're going to be on track. So part of what I do when I work with people, whether as a life coach or as an NLP practitioner or spiritual counselor, or I do weddings as well, is to get people to be empowered and to recognize the power that they have within them, not outside them. And it starts with our thoughts and being really mindful where we focus our attention. We're taught to, you know, just turn on the TV when you get home and believe the news that that's the reality. Uh, my reverend says that the news is a prayer request list, you know, and, and everything that has an agenda and is given to us because of whatever people that are in charge want us to have the outcome, we're not taught to use our right brain. Our right brain is where the internal guidance system is because it's intuitive, it's creative. We're taught problem solving from the time we're in kindergarten, 12th grade, and just problem solving. Let's figure it out. But Einstein said we can't solve a problem from the place it's created. So if we're trying to think it through, and the answer is through our intuition, through divine downloads, then we're going to constantly think that we're a victim of God's curse on us or, or whatever we've done wrong, whatever sins we've committed or society. So it's really important. The key to success and the key to living a life of whatever success is defined for, for you, is to know that you are the co-creator. And it's liberating. But it's also, it gives you, you have a lot of responsibility. Because then you can't, you can't play victim. I want to go back to the co-creating. Mm -hmm. And when, so you're saying that the individual who's listening or watching this program right now are in co-creation with whom? Who is the other partner in the co? Oh, good, good one. You know, the co-creation is you and your higher self, you and your higher power, you and God, you, whatever your belief system. And I'm not one to preach religion. I practice, you know, my spiritual path. And I believe that all paths lead to God and whatever practice the individual listener has that works for them. The important thing is that works for them, that, that it's, not, it's not something that's punishing them or having them be in a place of guilt. It's something that is helping them to evolve and grow and their soul to go to that next level. And so that co-relationship is something that's individual to each person. For me, it has grown and developed. Before, when I would pray, I would feel like it was a wish, like I could have just dropped a penny in a well. It was the same thing as making a prayer. Now, because I've taken the time to nourish and cultivate my relationship with my co-creator, I feel that I am in such a place of receptivity that I get answers to my prayers so fast and that I'm able to help other people in my private practice to also get answers as well by getting the ego. You know, they said that ego is edging good out or edging God out or edging guidance out because ego is identified with our personality and our persona and how we look and what will people say. And when we can release that, and I've learned a lot of that from the teachings of Eckhart Tolle, um, then we're free because we don't have that attachment to what other people say, what other people think. We're just able to co-create 
and allow ourselves to be in the right place at the right time with the right people and live synchronistically instead of as a victim. Meditation usually falls into one of two categories. Mm -hmm. It's usually an empty mind or a concentration on a particular topic. Which of those forms do you focus more on? Neither. Uh, <laughs> I actually uh, went to a meditation retreat and I remember my husband at the time was like, Deborah, you can't even stop talking for five minutes. How are you going to go for a weekend without talking? Because it was a silent meditation retreat. And it was so amazing, this meditation retreat, because the facilitator taught us that the goal of meditation is mindfulness. It's to be present and aware in the now. It's not necessarily to clear and empty your mind because the mind's purpose is to be thinking. So it would like telling, it'd be like telling your body not to be hungry or not to be thirsty or not to want sleep. It's telling your mind not to have thoughts is very futile, right? So he said, the goal is to be able to focus your attention, to get your attention in alignment and to choose to put it in alignment with your co-creator with a higher power. So we would just sit there and be still and we would breathe and then he would say, where's your attention? And then you would bring it back to center. And one of the things, I read this book by Brian Tracy called Maximum Achievement, and it was talking about when a plane flies in the air, it is never going directly in a straight line. It's always coming back to center and course correcting. And it's the same with meditation. When we're in our state of meditation, we can't have the goal to do it perfect where we're empty mind and we're in that nirvana state and just enlightened. It's about practicing, like with doing sit-ups. We're practicing getting volition of our attention so that when we want to make a choice, a conscious intention to be more grateful rather than fearful or to be more faithful rather than worried, that we can do it because we'll have that capacity. So say, where is my attention? Okay, my attention is on this. Okay, let me bring it back to center, back to center. And then you find as soon as you bring it back to center for a amount of like five minutes, 10 minutes, you're just in that zone. You know, you're just in that place. And it's not always like that, but it's like athletics. You know, when you're running, when I first started running, um, Oprah, my mentor, had inspired me. She had done a marathon. I had never even run around the block, but I said, hey, if Oprah can do it, I can do it. Why not? And so when I first started running, I was so out of breath. I was like, oh, my goodness. How am I supposed to do 26.2 miles? But I realized it's just this moment, just this moment. So I would be totally out of breath for 10 minutes, and then I would just get into the zone. And that's meditation. There's actually a meditation CD, I can't remember who it's by, about getting in the zone. It's like running as a meditation because you just get into that place where you're so centered and you're so conscious that you're, op you're like opening a portal to that divine voice that is downloading everything that you need to know to be successful or to live your life purposefully. And it's wonderful. But it's a practice, like anything else. Can't do sit-ups once and say, okay, I want to, I'm going to have a six-pack. It's like it's constantly practicing, but to enjoy it. And I think people don't meditate because they think they need to do it perfect. And one of the things that I, I learned for myself, when I got my license as a spiritual counselor, they called us practitioners. Not perfectionists, but practitioners. So it's a practice. And, you know, as long as you practice it, you will have results. In what ways do you nourish your spiritual consciousness? Hmm. Well, one of the ways that I nourish my spiritual consciousness is being out in nature. And I, you know, I live at the ocean and I try to get to the beach as much as possible because for me, being around water is a way that I feel connected. You know, when you look at the beach and you see the sand and you're like, there's no man that comes here and fills up the grains of sand every day, right? And if all the sand that's in my apartment every day doesn't take away any of the sand on the beach, and nobody fills up the ocean, right? The ocean just has that water that's there. And I look up at the sky and I see the beauty. It just is such a validation and a reminder of abundance that is everywhere, that has no beginning and no end. And I get into such a state of gratitude. And I think a wonderful practice for people to start co-creating is the practice of gratitude. You know, I said how were many people turned into that K-fear station. What if we tuned into that K-gratitude station and said, you know, just for today, I'm going to see if I can appreciate as many things as possible. So, like, I'll go through the day as a spiritual practice telling people how much I appreciate them. I'm like, thank you for doing this, and I appreciate this everywhere I go. And just the response to that, you know, is just this energy starts flowing, and you just 
feel it, you know, kind of like that pay it forward. And then it comes back to you multiplied. Whatever you give away, you get to keep. That's why I love um, being of service and having my ministry because I, I do it. And the person before me had a 15 year commitment. I was like, I'm just going to take it one year at a time. And I'm into my year and a half. But it's just so interesting how I get so much back from being able to, to give. So that's my spiritual practice, gratitude, giving back, being of service. That ministry Minister. that you just mentioned is through Agape Church. Mm -hmm, through the Agape so International Spiritual Center. Please tell Spanish us the details of that mission, that ministry. Oh, sure. Yeah, so the Agape International Spiritual Center is a trans-denominational center. So it, anyone can attend. You can attend your own church or your own temple, your own mosque, and also attend the spiritual center. It's open to everyone. And it just believe the simple belief there is that um, there is one God and we are one with it. And that's basically it. And my ministry is called Freedom Path. So it's for people who have been in recovery and we practice the 11th step, which is prayer and meditation. And we have a speaker come in. Why don't you tell us? Yeah, so the Freedom Path ministry, the purpose is it's an alternative or an adjunct to a 12-step program. It's not instead of a 12-step program. It's just to support people that have been in recovery to practice the Prince, the 11th step, which is prayer and meditation. And so we have a speaker that comes in and talks about a challenge that they've had in their life and how they've applied spiritual principle. Then they lead us in a meditation, a short, brief meditation. And then the, all the licensed spiritual practitioners, we get into small groups and we pray for each one of the individuals that are there attending. And some of the individuals have not been in a 12-step program, but we say anybody that experienced fear, because most addictions are based on fear. So if you are embracing faith and wholeness, then you'll be liberated. And so we do this every week, Mondays from 7 to 8 p.m. at the Agape International Spiritual Center in the teen room. And it's free and open to the public. And In what other ways are you of service to your community? Well, I feel that everything that I do with my work is being of service. I, I have a grant with the Children's Institute uh, that I actually, and I recommend this for everyone that's listening, uh, I, I, I have my master's degree in vocational counseling, so I'm always helping people to get jobs. And the best way to get any sort of job or employment is through networking and staying in contact with people. And I stayed in contact with one of my professors since 1998. And he said, if you ever need a job, come to me, but make sure you know your Spanish. So I was like, okay, muy bien. <laughs> and so um, he had a grant helping fathers get reintegrated into the lives of their family and to be present for their children, which for me was quite a stretch because up until that time, I was only working with women's groups and empowering women and doing work-life balance. So the fact that I was being called to work with men I believe was the divine calling, right? Because it's not something I would think of, oh, let me help men. Because I'm not a man, I don't, I'm not a father, I don't know the challenges. But then what spirit always tells me is that human beings are all the same and they all want the same thing, to feel that they belong, you know, Maslow, to feel that they're loved and to feel that they have a purpose. And so if I'm able to help people to do that, it doesn't matter if they're children, if they're men, if they're women, if they have been abused, if they're abusers, everybody is, I believe, children of God. And so I share the light and I pour them with love no matter what they've done, no matter what experience they've had. And so this grant um, helps people um, through life skills and career skills. I developed a curriculum that really gets people from victim consciousness to being at choice. And that's one of the first chapters in my book, uh, The Power of Choice, called Confessions of an Adrenaline Addict. So I teach the same success principles that I would teach a CEO or COO at a corporate training to people that are homeless, to people that have been in juvenile detention centers or are in juvenile detention centers, because I have been in a detention center. Uh, I've worked with the Phoenix House with teenagers that are in recovery, foster youth, um, all different populations, uh, immigrants who are wanting to learn English and get their life started. So I believe that all of that is being of service in the community and really spreading the message that um, I've been given. What kind of seminars do you and have you given? Uh, <laughs> one of the seminars that is one of my favorites is on time expansion um, because people would say to me, well, if I just could have an extra hour in the day, I'd be able to get everything done. And I'd say, well, you know what? 
I do a lot of traveling as a speaker, and I've had like 27 hours in a day. One time I was traveling from east to west, and it was daylight savings, and I think I had like 28 hours. It was just like um, remarkable. But we're not going to get more done if we have more time. It's really about energy and energy efficiency. So I was, I've done a lot of seminars teaching people um, the principles of expanding time and to know that time is relative because when we're enjoying ourselves and having fun, time just flies by, like we're on that vacation. By the time we get that, you know, beautiful, you know, palm tree above us, then it's time to get on the plane again. Or when we're in a boring meeting, time just seems to tick on and tick on. Or when we have a tragedy in our life, time seems to stop. So I do a lot of um, seminars on time. Also work-life balance, which falls in alignment with that. I've done a lot of stress management. I work with the military, so I've done uh, trainings for the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marines, the U.S. Air Force, Army. Uh, just I travel all around places you would never imagine, like Yuma, Arizona, and um, deep, deep, deep in the desert because a lot of missile testing that the Navy is doing. And so it's really interesting and also something I would never think of, you know, that I'm going to be working with like rocket scientists at aerospace companies. Um, that develop missiles or people in the military that develop missiles and spread the principles that I have that are based on ease and grace and peace and love. But, you know, this is where it's needed. You know, one of the things I used to do was uh, workshops at Agape in my spiritual community and in other spiritual centers. And I realized rather than preaching to the choir, people that are already aware of this, I need to go where people are unaware. And I went to uh, Westlaco, Texas uh, every weekend last month, I think it was in August, and I work with migrant Latinas who never even thought about going to high school, much less going to college. And me and a, a group of, of Latina, three of which are PhDs, uh, to share with them opportunities that they have to really empower themselves and go to the next level. So definitely those are things that really inspire me and uh, help me help others. How did you become first become a speaker? This is kind of a funny story. Uh, you know, one of the things I really believe in is mentorship, and I've been a mentor with different nonprofits, uh, motivating our students through experience, Students Run LA, um, and other programs like that. And one of my mentors said, you know, I really think that speaking would be important for you and what you're here to do. You know, I don't know if you know Deborah in the Bible, is she's the prophetess of truth, so she is the power of the word. And he's just like, you need to speak. And I was like, hmm. So at Agape, they had a Toastmasters meeting, and he dragged me in there, like kicking and screaming, and they asked me, you know, will you do a 30-second table topic? And I was like, no, I like refused. And, I, you know, I just turned it down, and then we just kept going every week. And finally, I had the courage to speak, and I started giving speeches. And people would ask me, wow, you know, you're, you're a good speaker. Where, where do you speak, and how much do you charge? I was like, you get paid to speak? I'm like, I, I've never spoken before. I was just wanting to improve my self-esteem and my leadership skills. And they said, well, we have this nonprofit, and it was called MANA. It was a, a mentoring organization for young Latinas in San Diego. They said, we'd like to, you to speak at my conference. And so I spoke there, and then from there, I just literally got speaking engagements from one audience to another. I've never advertised for speaking. I've never hired a salesperson. I've never done sales calls. It has all been my, my mantra is that I'm in the right place at the right time meeting the right people. One time on a plane, I wanted to do more of Latina market stuff and I was sitting next to the event coordinator for Macy's for the Latina market. And the next thing you know, I'm doing like inner empowerment in the malls um, to help uh, young Latinas and professional Latinas to uh, have inner beauty. So it just, it just divinely, it's not luck. <laughs> That's my thing. It's just being co-creative and being focused on your intention and what you want and then being available and receptive for the guidance that's telling you what to do and being faithful knowing that if you're given the idea if that thought is in your brain everything that you need for that to happen will be there even if you can't see it by eyesight believe it by insight and that's what I was telling my foster girls this morning don't look from what's visible what you can see trust and have faith in the invisible the inaudible and then miracles they happen every day. Besides meditation, what other spiritual practices do you personally have? Well, I pray. I have several prayer partners and I have learned 
uh, there's no prayer too small. You know, some people think, well, I don't want to bother God. God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniactive, and God is there for you. That's my belief. That's what I know. And so everything from the time, if I go on a plane and I want to pray for ease and grace and safe travel, uh, every, and I pray for, I have about three prayer partners. And any time that they have an issue or concern, they'll either text me or email me or call me and we'll leave each other prayers and have regular prayer time. I also do visioning. This is a process that was coined by Dr. Michael Beckwith, which is uh, when you're in a meditative state, anchoring gratitude and unconditional love, you're asking questions of your higher power. What is the vision for my life? Who am I to be for this vision to unfold? What do I need to let go of? And this has been so key to me. In fact, my second book, is all about letting go. Because as an adrenaline addict, I think, oh, well, I just need to do more and more and more. And then I would take on so much that I wouldn't have enough energy to be able to do anything. I would start projects and not finish them. So in addition to having a to-do list now, I have a let go list. So I'm letting go of things. And so part of my spiritual principle is letting go and just trusting that the more I let go and say no of what is not my purpose, then the more available I will be for things to come through. And I've had so many examples of it where I've said no to a speaking engagement because it wasn't in alignment with my belief system and then something even better came that I wouldn't have been able to d have done unless I said no. I say, okay, you're in Van Nuys mm -hmm. waiting for a train to go to Palm Springs. Right. And in comes a train that says San Diego on it. And you stand there hassling the conductor with the going to San Diego saying take me to Palm Springs take me to Palm Springs and after three hours of hassling him he says come don't come I don't care we're going to San Diego right be he pulls out and right behind him pulls in another train that says Palm Springs on it and the conductor of that train says what was that idiot doing blocking the station for three hours ah that's funny okay you have my permission to use that and so it's <laughs> but it's the same principle that you can't your train can't pull in wow. if your station's blocked. Mm, that is so good, Bruce. I like that. Okay. I think that's so important. I think people really need to hear that and to embrace that because oftentimes we are trying to push a, like a round peg in a square hole, you know, and we are socialized in our society no pain, no gain, put the ax to the grindstone, let's make it happen. And we're not realizing, sometimes it's not about making it happen. One of the principles in my book is about the power of surrender. It's about allowing it to unfold through and as us. And when we do that, sometimes it means us getting out of our own way and allowing something higher and allowing something better. We can't even conceive it. It's not even in our consciousness. But when we're open, that's why like when you asked me what we were gonna do, I didn't ask a million questions like, well, what is it going to be and blah, 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 because I just trust the universe now. Like if the universe is going to put me in front of somewhere, everything that needs to be will be and not to question, just to be available. So important. You say your second book that you, is that a book that you have written, the one that you have there next to you, or is that another book that you're working on? No, it's another book that I'm working on and it's this book that I wrote, Confessions of an Adrenaline Addict, literally was an example of the divine download through me. And Wayne Dyer talks about this with his book, The Power of Intention, where I feel literally like I transcribed it from spirit. So a lot of the chapters that were written, like The Power of Surrender, I hadn't even embraced the principle yet when I was writing that book because it was being taught to me simultaneously. The book that I wanted to write was called um, um, time expansion, how to do a, like a million things all at once, you know, because as an adrenaline addict, that's what we want. But my co-author and I, Adelaide Dunton, we just went for a walk on the beach and we did the visioning process. And this was the book that came. They said, no girls, instead of telling people what to do, you need to confess how your life has been crazy, unmanageable, and how you've tried to control it and how, what the consequences were and what the contrary action is and what the steps are. And that's what the book is. But there was one chapter called The Power of Surrender that's about letting go that really has been my biggest area of growth, right? Because as an entrepreneur, as someone that's kind of like an alpha female used to being in control and knowing what's going to happen, my biggest learning has been to surrender and release and trust. 
trust a higher power, trust a partner, trust that everything is going to be in alignment. And so the next book is all about how to do that. It's taking it to the next level. And so I've been having a lot of experiences, of course, whatever you focus on expands, that have been giving me lessons in surrender. So that's what the next book is going to be about. And it's going to be a very interactive book, like having a coach with you. So there's going to be exercises and then guided meditations that people are going to be able to go to online to be able to really experience the, the, the learning of the book, not just the, experience, the reading of it, you know? So many books we read and then we don't practice it, but it's about getting them to practice it and really see results. When are you, what's your publication date? Um, my publication date will be October of this year, and that's uh, numerologically, I just, that was the, the day I was given, and I'm self-publishing. I have a publishing company. And as a speaker, it's just easier for me to do it that way. Do you attend any house of worship other than Agape? Not formally. I, I really love the Self-Realization Center that's here over in Pacific Palisades. I mean, they're everywhere. But I go there to meditate. And I don't attend their services, but I just I get a lot of peace and clarity there. But when I was younger, I was very open. And uh, I used to go to Christian church with one neighbor, Jehovah's Witness Hall with another neighbor, and Catholic church with another. I just, I really just was so curious and open to what was out there. And so I just, I'm, I'm open to that. And, and now that I'm doing weddings, it's just part of what I do as a spiritual counselor is I officiate ceremonies. So I can do house blessings or memorials. And I just uh, formed this company called I Do Your Wedding. And I started doing my first wedding. It's just so beautiful to be a part of somebody's life in that way. So you're an ordained minister? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a spiritual counselor. And then you, for the day, wherever you are, can become a, you know, an officiant. And that's sanctioned by the state of California? Mm -hmm. And whatever city that you're in. You're called a commissioner. You're called a, you are a commissioner. Mm -hmm. And what's the process of getting that? You just uh, get a permit fill out a paperwork, get a permit. That's the non-denominational way. And the spiritual counselor, as a spiritual counselor, that's the spiritual license to do weddings. And then I But that, the spiritual license has nothing to do with sanctioned by the state of California. Right. exactly. You already answered this question, but I'm going <laughs> to ask it again. Because I want you to address it specifically yes. head on. If one of our listeners were a beginner and had no spiritual practice, what would you recommend to start? I think that the simplest spiritual practice is gratitude, is practicing, focusing your energy and your attention on being grateful. And whether you get up in the morning and decide to do a gratitude list or whether every hour you say, I'm going to focus on three things that I'm appreciative on. It's interesting when I teach corporate training, the number one thing that employees want besides more money is to feel appreciated. And so if we give what we want to receive, we'll find that it appears in our life. So if everyone out there that wanted to have more of a spiritual connection would go out there and be appreciative of other people, they would find a real shift in their interactions and interpersonal relationships with other people. And then also, all relationships are based on a relationship with their self. And it's about self-love. The path of spirituality is a path of love and it's a path of loving ourselves and forgiving ourselves so besides gratitude the second practice that i would do and i had learned in 12-step programs is forgiveness and paul farini i don't know if you've read any of his 30 million books he's got so many books on forgiveness and in fact colin tipping has a radical forgiveness worksheet that you can get online and i would practice doing that radical forgiveness worksheet and whoever during the day upsets you, pisses you off, gets you angry, then practice going through that worksheet and that will help you let go. Because it's like you were saying, it's allowing that space. You're not blocking. Anytime you're resentful of someone, you're blocking energy to hear the divine downloads and the divine guidance. So just the act of being grateful and being forgiving is going to open yourself up to be more spiritually receptive. If someone were a beginner and had never been of service to their community, what would you recommend as a beginning practice? I would recommend that they identify a population that they're passionate about serving. So whether it's the homeless 
or whether it's at-risk youth or, you know, who is it that they have a lot of compassion for? Who is it that they feel, or who is it that they complain about that they think there's a problem with? Because to be part of the solution. So if they're like, I just don't understand why these people are on welfare. Okay, well maybe you can be a part of the solution of having an innovative program that helps people get from welfare to work. Maybe that's your nonprofit. You know, so start by volunteering in that system, see what the challenges are, and see what innovative ideas are downloaded to you to come up with a solution. If someone would like to feel a calling, but they never have, is there some way that you're aware of that they can instigate a calling? It, it goes back to that principle of visioning that I was telling you about. One thing that they can do, they say that the quality of our life depends on the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. So when people go to work and they have a job, one of my mentors says a job is just over broke, right? We're exchanging time for money, right? And if we're, like most people, we're going to be on a rat race because the more money we make, the more money we spend, and then we get credit, and then we're in debt. So if you want to have a life of service and to be on purpose, you could ask yourself, what is the vision for my life? How can I be even more of service? And I learned that even more. I studied NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is basically, you know, the words we use is the language patterns, which creates the programs in our mind, which either are empowering, lifting us up, or are viruses and slowing us down. And so when you say even more, you're already putting it in your subconscious that you're already doing it. Because just asking the question means that you're open and receptive. So how can I be even more available to being on purpose and to being of service? So, and, and if none of those questions resonate for you, you can just journal and say, and see what comes up. You know, journal with your right hand and say, you know, what is my purpose? What is my vision? How can I be even more of service? And then with the other hand, answer. This could be a way to get your right brain activated. So you may want to write with your um, dominant hand and answer with another hand or just use a different color. You know, it can really help you to activate and do what works for you. Many times people don't start a spiritual practice or being of service because they feel like, well, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. So what does work? There's got to be something that works. Practice. Try different things. Maybe dancing works for you. Salsa dancing. Yeah, you know, that could activate your creativity. Is there anything that I've neglected to ask you that you think it bears mentioning right now? Well, one of the other principles that has been so valuable to me that I talk about too in the book is, is the power of now. The only way that I can stay sane, because I don't know if you've ever watched In Living Color, and they said, what do you do for a living, man? And he says, I've got 10 jobs, man. I'm a teacher, I'm a counselor, I'm a coach, I'm a minister, I'm a... Did you ever watch that? No, it was so funny. So anyway, uh, you know, I have so many things that I'm doing. I mean, I literally probably have 10 people that could be working for me and I would still need more assistance. And the only way I could stay focused and be on purpose is to say what is going on right now. Literally, people will say, well, wh what are you doing this weekend? I'm like, I'm not even thinking about this weekend. I'm just in totally focusing all of my energy and my attention on today. Focusing all, you know, right now, what am I doing? And to be totally present. Because if I'm thinking on, oh, what do I need to do tonight with my ministry or what still is on my plate, I actually slow down my ability to be productive. My resources are being expended in the future of what isn't even happening yet or worry about what could happen or what should have happened yesterday. But being present in the now is another spiritual principle that I use that gives me peace, which allows me to expand my creativity and allow the receptivity to those downloads. So definitely asking yourself, it's going back to that meditation. Where's my attention? Is it in the past? Is it in the future? And to focus it on the now. And I have a little salsa step that I do. You want to show it to you? Please. Okay, right. Okay, but you have to do it. Don't trip. Oh, I have to do no, it. No, you, you don't have to do it. But when, when I speak, I have everybody do this. So in salsa dancing, don't trip on your mic. it says uh, the first thing that you do is take a step back. So I have everybody take a step back, right? So you take a step back, of course, with passion, because you want anything you do, you need to do it passionately. If you're being of service, you need to be passionate about she what you're doing. She's still in the frame. Go back. Right? So back here is where a lot of people have their energy focused on the past. And they think about what they would have or could have or should have done during the day, right? So when you're focused your energy in the past, can you move forward? No. Because 
50% of your energy is back here. You are feeling, you're feeling like you're walking in mud or you're dragging a dead weight. So then what you need to do is you need to go forward. So the next step in salsa dancing is forward, right? So you go forward, right? But what's the problem here? Many people get into what they call the um, manana wana syndrome where they're procrastinating and they say, okay, I'm going to start going back to school when I have this money or when the kids leave or when this happens. And they go, when, when, when? And what happens is that never comes. There's no when on the calendar. There's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So they get stuck. So the point of power is not in the past and not in the future, but in the now. So in salsa dancing, we like to come into the center. I do it with a little flair, right? <laughs> Coming into the now. So see, when you're in the now, you're balanced. Your energy isn't being wasted by what ifs of the future or what ifs of the past. You're totally available and receptive. And one way to get into the now, simple way, is your breath. So anytime you feel frenetic and like, what am I going to do? There's all this stuff going on. You can just stop, even for a minute. Like I'll set my alarm. Um, once an hour for 60 seconds, I would just breathe. And I would just, just bringing my attention back to the now, back to the now and say, where's my attention? What is it I want to do? And then I'm at peace. So that's your salsa shuffle tool to get yourself into the now. It's fun too. Thank you, that's <laughs> great. If you could have any superpower, <laughs> what would you choose? Oh my goodness, I was thinking about this the other day. Definitely flying, because I, I love traveling and I don't like to be in planes. <laughs> I like to have the freedom. If I could fly, I would be all over the world doing the same thing that I'm doing here. It would just be easier and less. I was sleeping in the airport the other day because for some reason they didn't want to let me on. We were like there two hours early, but because the line was too long. And anytime those things happen, I always ask myself, what is the lesson? Because if I ask why me, that I'm in victim. So as I was sleeping on the floor in Miami airport, I was just wondering, you know, do I need to be more compassionate for people that are homeless, that don't have a place to sleep? Because it's not comfortable sleeping on the floor. And how many times have I just walked by a homeless person and been like, well, they just need to get their act together. So it really humbled me to be even more grateful for all the blessings that I have. So definitely flying. <laughs> I'm about to offer you a really big opportunity. On the other side of this camera here is the entirety of humanity, all 6.7 billion of us. What would you say to us? One of the biggest lessons that I've learned is, you know, I've always said, well, I want to be like this person or I want to please my dad and, and make him proud. And oftentimes I would try to be that other person and act like I was them. And I realized that I need to be myself and that I need to be authentic. And that if I go through challenges, if I have problems in life, if I'm not feeling in alignment, that rather than playing like I have it all together, that actually my vulnerability and my being uh, in a place of honesty with my challenges actually frees and liberates other people rather than pretending like I have everything all together. So uh, my, my biggest lesson has been to be authentic and to know that it's not to be like Oprah or to be like somebody else, but to be the best me that I can and to know that that's not perfect and it's never gonna be perfect. But as long as I'm willing and open to evolve and to allow my soul to grow and expand, that it will be good enough. And I think that's the biggest thing that humanity suffers from, not feeling good enough and not feeling worthy. And it is that that separation that leads to addiction, that leads to fear. And so when we know that we are worthy, no matter what has happened, no matter what circumstance, condition, situation in our life, that we're worthy and deserving, and that we can be the best we can at any given moment, that everything will fall into an alignment. And that's where success with ease and grace comes from. Thank you so much Thank for meeting you. with us.